Uh, next up, we have uh, Professor Tom Duncan from Radford University. He's going to be presenting uh, research from his dissertation, correct, um, on the overlooked costs of the permanent war economy and market process approach. Now, uh, Tom's research more broadly focuses on the political economy of warfare, along with his co-author, Chris Coyne who is slotted and agreed to be a presenter for Econ Club in the spring nice. on his new book, Doing Bad by Doing Good. Um, Chris was Tom's dissertation advisor, so you can sort of see the second generation of research output from that screen. So take it away, Tom. Well, I normally start by reading my title, but that seems to have a better at this point. So, um, we'll go into it. Thank you guys, first of all, for having me on here. Up. I'm not going to publicly shame you into giving more events the way Dan does. Um, I'm just going to thank you guys for coming to this one. Alright, so what am I going to talk to you about? Well, to start off with, the U.S. has been a state of permanent war, at least economically speaking, since the end of World War II. Um, and I do mean economically speaking. And the true costs of this permanent war economy uh, have previously been understated in the literature because they don't really focus on the way that the permanency of the war economy undermines the dynamic nature of the market. And I'll get to what that means. And the reason for the constant distortion lies in the institutional structure of the military industrial complex. So it's an institutional problem. We're not the first to talk about the permanent war economy. In fact, one of the most famous people who brought up the problem that we were going to face in the future was Eisenhower in his 1961 Farewell Address. So in 1961 he gave the Farewell Address to the office of the President. He said, we've been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions whose influence we're not quite sure of yet, but we know that it's going to be massive. He neglected to talk about the fact that he had a great hand in building this. He was sort of like, I help, you know, it's bad. Sorry, guys, I'm out. <laughs> um, but he did talk about it, and he warned that in the Council of Government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military industrial complex. So, how have we done? Well, his warning didn't go entirely unheeded. Um, we have people like Seymour Melvin, who writes about the politicization of the military. Um, we have Robert Gates, who you guys probably know, who talks about the rash effect. So, you know, we have a crisis in the military, crisis of war, military, government, gets power, it doesn't get back as much as it took previously. Um, we have John Mueller, who writes good stuff about, you know, our overreaction to things, right? We have a crisis react way out of proportion, and that leads also to negative effects. And then, the is pretty good on this, writing about the increasing power of the Pentagon for the, for the years. Um, so those are other people that you guys can check out. And then there are the people who actually think that this is a good thing, right? They fall into the military Gamesian branch. Uh, in fact, in 1933, in the midst of FDRs starting to use these policies, uh, the Keynesian policies, Keynes wrote an open letter to FDR saying, in fact, my policy program works best if you use it to the military because people don't have as much of a strong reaction when you start spending for the military as they do when you start spending for domestic programs. Because we like our military and we like to think that what they're doing is out there defending us. And so when people say, we're going to cut spending to the military, our first reaction often is, well, are we going to be more or less safe when you do this? And we tend to think we're going to be less safe. And when you spend more on it, we're going to be more safe. So it's a great way to get the program sort of off the ground if you're trying to spin. Um, Mark Hewson talks about in some of her work about the way that Reagan actually, you know, we all love Reagan, but that he used this policy to sort of use the military to shore up industrial policy throughout the 80s and that whenever he felt that something was flagging, he put more defense money at it during the Cold War. Um, and in fact, they go on to talk about the rise of the gun belt, where we actually get a geographic reshaping of the U.S. based on the defense spending. Right? So you can think of it in terms of the L.A. area. Right? How did L.A. get its start? Well, mostly the airspace industry, or the air industry, and later became the airspace industry. Places in Texas, 
Virginia, Northern Virginia. Right? Northern Virginia is the home of the spy network and now cybersecurity. And it is largely funded by defense funds. So you get people moving around the US based on where the defense funding happens. And then there are people like Fuller, who Fuller wrote uh, in 2011 and 2012 about the effect that cutting defense funding would have in the face of the fiscal cliff. This was when the original fiscal cliff, when everyone thought it was going to be catastrophe, and then my government punted for a while, and then came back and faced it again. And so I'll get to some of the numbers that he uses later. But as I said, the reality is that since basically the end of World War II, we've been in this permanent war economy. And so we've had mobilizations and we've had demobilizations based around whether or not we were actually engaged in the war. And so you'll still see variations in the trend. But what you're going to see is very, very variations around the trend that's much higher than what was happening in the pre-war levels, in the pre-World War levels. Um, so it's not you know, a short-term mobilization. It is a long-term mobilization. Uh, we got above $350 billion. 1950s, these are 2010 dollars, and we spend annually about 700, 700 billion dollars a year, and we haven't dropped below 350 since around 1953. So it is a large term spending. So what does it look like? Here's those numbers graphically. You right, can see that's up. We did get a demobilization right after World War II, which is too much pent up. Resistance to wanting to continue the fighting. Everyone wanted to come home and settle down. Um, and so they did. They came home very briefly. Within three years of the war's end, you start to see the trend ratcheting up again. And when we enter Korea, we enter the Cold War. And it continues basically ever after. And then we spike again you know, in 2001, right after 9 11. To kind of put this in perspective, in 2008 alone, single year, the U.S. spent half the world's military spending. Right, we accounted for half, 48%. Our next closest competitor, if we were looking at this as a competition, is the collection of nations in our ally sector of NATO. Right, a collection of nations doing 20%, while well, we're doing 50. And then our closest threat, who we consider threats in the U.S., is you know, China at 7%, Russia at 5%, right? These are the people that we're worried will outclass us militarily, right? We're spending half the world, and no one else is even coming close. This is a single decade, right? An increase in its spending. So after 9-11, we get, right, we entered some wars. The wars are dropped out, right? We get 700% increase in spending based on the wars. And so I'm not as concerned with the amount of spending that we have based on war, but you enter a war, you plan to spend more. But in the non-war sector, right, not counted as going towards war, we get a 43% increase just in the base budget. We get a 240% in homeland security. Remember that number, that one's going to be important later, right? That's, those are the ones that are protecting us here in the U.S. from terrorism. Right, a 240% increase in this 10-year period. We also get, you know, nuclear weapons, atomic defense, energy defense spending increases. Although, right, who's the only person that's ever used a nuclear weapon in war? Right, that's us. Right, no one else has done it. And yet we continue increasing spending on that, just in case. So what's the problem, right? I've given you some numbers, right? The real problem is what these numbers actually mean, and it means that you think of it this way. If national defense is intended to actually protect the market institutions that make America what America is, right, what happens when those institutions that are designed to protect your market are actually the ones that are hurting you? We are allowing the military to approach into the private sector, into the private property, and we're going to have Distortions, and we're getting those distortions because we've entered a realm where rather than protecting the economy, we protect the war economy. Right? We're much more interested in protecting our industrial base in the war economy than we are the rest of our industrial base for goods manufactured that people actually buy. In fact, the definition 
1944. This is 1944 when Oakes coined the term permanent war economy. He was preempting it. And the fact that he saw the institutional changes that were happening during World War II and realized we might never get back out of this. And so when he defined the war economy, he said exist whenever government's expenditures for war or national defense become a legitimate and significant in purpose of the economic activity. So are we in such a war? How are we doing with our unwarranted influence? This is the M1 Abrams tank. Right? This is just one example of how the military industrial complex works. For a variety of reasons, the Army has decided that this tank is not really serviceable in the field. Um, one, we don't often fight, or we're not expected to fight, many tank-to-tank -tank combats. It's really good tank-to-tank, -tank. it's not really good in all other situations. Um, one of the things it's particularly not good at is bombs underneath it. The bottom, the bottom of the tank is very weak, so what happens when you throw a sticky bomb on the bottom of it is it becomes a very, very expensive stationary motor. Right? Where do we usually fight? It also doesn't handle sand very well. Right? So where are all our protected wars to be, and what type of wars are they? They're going to be mostly urban warfare, the same places where people are throwing bombs at you. And so the Army says, we don't want it. Don't really know what to do with it. In fact, we have 3,000 of these that we're storing in a facility in California. Just taking up space, storage costs for us. We prefer not to have them. So they say nothing, don't make any more. And Congress says, yes, continue making them. In fact, we will continue making them. We are going to throw money at you, and you're going to keep having them. And the General Hughes says, no, really, really don't want them. And the Army and Congress again says, you're going to take them, whether or not you want them. There were a whole list of congressmen, about 120 of congressmen signed a letter saying you're going to continue doing it. The reasoning for this, the General Dynamics Land Systems Company facility in Lima, Ohio, needs 70 tanks a year in order to stay in business. So what happens if they don't send tanks to the Army? Well, this facility closes. However, this facility closes for three years because the Army says, we want them eventually. We're going to want more in 2017, and that's when we can re- tool our whole fleet at least, we'll upgrade everything, and we'll build some more. So we really, we're just asking you to close it from about 2014 to 2017. And in fact, they crunched the numbers and said, it will actually save you a billion dollars to close it for three years and start back up. And Congress still says, no, you're going to keep buying the tanks. And they're still buying the tanks. Because we need to keep this factory going. Because what happens if the factory closes? The factory closes, the people get out of work, and someone in a congressional seat loses their voting block. This is just a glimpse into the military industrial complex. But what I don't want you to take away from this is that what I'm trying to argue um, is that the military should get whatever it asks for. Right? They get a lot of stuff. Right? They're still getting the F-35, which has become the most expensive military program in history, right? The planes now are around $200 million per plane. It has become so expensive that other nations are backing out of the deal because they can't afford it. And yet we're still making it. I mean, Britain has been very hesitant. Canada has started up its own military industrial complex to avoid paying for the F-35. Right? So the military gets a lot of things. This is just a look at how the system works. And so how does this come about? We get that sort of situation, we get into that sort of situation because of the continuous interplay between Congress, the military, and the industry. Right? We end up in a situation where we have our military industrial policy, where defense spending is viewed as let's keep people working rather than focusing on the actual national security. And in the case of something like the M1 Zero Sank, what we're actually seeing is that we're cutting, we're, we're keeping jobs at the expense of security, right? Because what happens if we could have spent that money somewhere else on something that actually could have made us safer? We don't get to because we're locked into this lobbying situation. 
And what happens is your defense becomes, in essence, untouchable. Right? An untouchable, necessary, not negotiable, you know, whatever. You know, it's become taboo to want to cut spending in Congress. Because someone's always going to be hurt by it. Even in the original build-up to the fiscal cliff, right, they signed a contract with Lockheed Martin to keep the F-35s coming. They said, we're going to take a fiscal hit if the fiscal cliff happens. And what we want to make sure is that we continue this program. And so they got in before it happened so that they were contracted by law in order to keep producing these planes, even though they're really expensive planes. And even though we're not really sure what use they have, because who do we fight plane to plane anymore, which is what these are designed for. Again, we don't really fight for the style. We don't fight people who have the capability of fighting us in the air. <coughs> However, even in the lead up to this, the Pentagon did find a few ways to trim. And what they found to trim was, in fact, actual waste, right? This isn't talking about whether or not they were going to cut the programs. So they actually found you know, $800 million of just waste that they could trim for themselves because they weren't being called to task for it. So maybe the industrial base isn't as untouchable as we think it is. We just have this idea that it's not. And the way to start getting at this problem to determine whether or not it's actually untouchable and whether or not we're, in a sense, overspending or whether or not there are costs to the spending is to look at it through the institutional approach, the comparative institution. <laughs> And so our two that we're comparing is the market versus the administrative decision-making procedure. How do decisions get made in the market? Right? How do we determine whether or not something is valuable, whether or not something should be created? We sell it. Right? If you sell it and you don't make money on it, then obviously when you start taking losses, you realize it's not valuable and you stop selling it. If you make a profit on it, then it's valuable and you keep selling it. We have consumer demand filtered through the system of profit and loss. In the administrative decision making, the way that we determine whether or not we're going to buy something is someone just determines whether or not we're going to buy something. You sit down, you make up a budget, whatever that budget might be, and you have a budgetary price that you're willing to spend on something, and then you spend it. And so you get administrative preferences that are filtered through systems of political clout and rent seeking, right? Rather than the actual feedback mechanisms of profit and loss. So what happens when I spend too much of my budget on something, as long as it's accounted for in the budget? How do I know whether or not I'm spending correctly? In defense, the question is, what is the production function of defense? How much defense do we need? How do we determine how much defense we need? Right? In a market setting, it's how much people are willing to pay for. In the administrative setting, it's much different than that. It's what military and congressional leaders negotiate on and determine the appropriate level of defense. And what is their incentive in this? Right. We've moved away from sort of a price system. We did this emerging through World War II, and that's why we get the change. During World War II, we moved to a much more centralized defense nation. We moved to a We moved to a system where it was a very top-down approach, right? So Congress deter took over the market, took over the industry market. In fact, they had rations. They stopped other production, non-defense production, rationing out the goods. And this is why you get an entire economy geared towards war. Right? And a lot of those institutions, once they got put into place, right, through the industry, through the military, through labor unions even, Right? They, they get in, they become vested interests. Right? They're getting gains from the fact that this institutional structure exists, and they don't want to change, they don't want change afterwards. And so we get locked into the system where we have centralized control, where we have administrative decision making, and we have defense done by budget rather than defense done by crisis. Right? So previously, what happened? We go to war. But war would break out, we'd re-gear, we'd start producing military items. At the end of the war, government releases, all con releases most of the control, it goes back to private production, everything gets produced. After World War II, once these interests had gotten in, they decided not to release this time, 
And so we end up in a situation where we're going to continue with military production rather than freeing it up to get non-military production. And during the war, we got focused on capacity, which if you ever read anything about defense right now, what are we always worried about? What is the biggest problem that we're worried about in terms of our industrial base? It's capacity. Because what we want to be able to do is if World War III breaks out, we want to be able to ramp up our capacity immediately. So we have to keep a reserve amount of capacity just in case we ever need it. That's why you don't let the tank fall out. That's at least the rationale for why you don't let the tank fall out. Because you want the option to make it if you ever need to make it. But since we're in the system where I'm just deciding, say I'm, I'm in charge, I'm deciding, so I think that what we need is the tank, or I think that what we need is the F-35. I'm going to change my budget, I'm going to adapt my budget to do it, and I'm just going to buy it. It's done. How do I know whether or not I've made the right decision? I can't have the recourse to, to loss, right? Because the people whose money it is that's spending aren't the people that are actually paying for it. At the, at the time of the purchase. Because the way that our military structure is set up is people get taxed, tax money goes into the budget, the budget then determines, the people in charge of the budget can determine how much we're going to spend on the military. And so you, who are actually consumers of military, because you are the ones who want to be safe, right? How much safety do you want? Right? There's a, there's a, measure of how much safety you will. Right? And the way that we could get at this under a market setting would be how much are you willing to pay for it. But in the way that we've now designed our system, you guys don't have that sort of feedback mechanism. What's your feedback mechanism now? The feedback mechanism that you have right now for telling Congress how much defense you want is a voting mechanism. The problem with the vote it is it's not a clean signal in the way that buying or not buying a product is a clean signal. So you can think of our last presidential election. Right? What president would I have voted for that would have cut my military spending? Yeah. Which one who had a chance of winning <laughs> would I have voted for? Right? I mean, it's true. As much as we'd like to pretend otherwise. Right? If you actually watched the foreign policy debate, it was the scariest debate in the world because one of them says, I'm going to blow people up, and the other one says, I'm going to blow more people up. And it was like a race to the bottom. <laughs> right? And even if one of them had said, you know, what I'm going to do is I want to cut defense spending. When I cast my vote in the voting booth, how do they know that's what I'm voting for? Because the way that we do voting right now is you're buying an entire package. You're buying a candidate. And with that candidate comes every policy that he wants. So am I voting for his domestic policy? Am I voting for his foreign policy? It's not as clear a signal as just profit and loss. So my information is squishier in a way. There's a lot that we, they don't get to know about us, and so there's a lot of wiggle room in defense spending. So at some level, they spend... They could spend so much that everyone decides we don't want to spend it. But at the margin, right, they don't know how much they should be spending. What this means is not only are they unable to determine, you know, levels of overall risk, but they're also not able to get the optimal mix, right? Do I want, as the consumer of defense, am I worried about problems that can be solved if we had more drones or if we had more army men, like, on the ground? Right, what, how do I, what makes me feel safer as the consumer? That information is also lost in the way that we're doing it. And so we get, we don't know what the optimal levels are, and we don't know what the mix is. And the lack of that punishment of that system of loss, profit and loss, that would actually bind them, leads to, you know, room in the budget. So you don't have to think of them as bad people, right? Simple, simply works out this way. I have all this money out of the budget and I get to determine who I want to work with. Well, I like you. You've invited me over for Christmas parties, right? You know, your wife's nice to me. You know, your kids aren't jerks. You know, I'll help you out. You know, here's a, you know, here's a contract, right? 
Now, you may not be the best. You may not have even been the most cost effective. You just happen to be the one that I like the best, and I, I'm not called to task for the fact that I chose you. In fact, through the war period and afterwards, what we ended up with is a system where deals, rather than being based on price and efficiency, become based in large part on competency. Part of what competency entails is whether or not you work with the Pentagon. Right? Now, there's at least some reason for this, right? Because if you've worked with the Pentagon before, you kind of know how to navigate it because there's a lot of red tape involved. Right? And they might be a little more sure of your product. But it also means that there are a lot of people who could be really good at their job out there, really good at producing the tools for war, that never get a shot. Right? Because they didn't have the connections. They, didn't have, they weren't friends with anyone they could have decided this. I don't want to imply that there are no prices, right? Because there are prices. They just mean something entirely different from what market price means. Because these prices are administratively determined, which means I just state what the price is going to be. And then you take it or leave it. We negotiate prices based directly with the industry rather than have the prices determined with any sort of process. Any sort of efficiency in the market process. Right? What this also leads to is, is if you're trying to compare like the price of a car versus the price of a jet, you're comparing two entirely different things. Because the prices don't mean the same things, which means the resources may be used inappropriately or misallocated. But what I've given you so far is reason to think that we don't know what the optimal amount of defense is. That doesn't mean that it's too high. That just means that we don't know what it is. Right, so it could be too low, it could be too high, we don't really know. So why should we suspect that the amount that we're spending on defense <coughs> is too high? You guys remember that number from before from the Homeland Security, 240%? 240% protect us against terrorist threats. Something you might not be aware of is that there is actually a terrorism risk insurance market. Right? Big buildings buy insurance against terrorism like a Sears Tower or something like that, we buy insurance. This is a private insurance market, and so they're operating based on the probabilities of whether or not there's, whether or not there's an attack. <coughs> now there was a brief spike in the probabilities right after 9-11, and then they settled back down to zero, near zero. There is almost a zero probability of a large-scale terrorist attack. And yet, with our probability settling back down to zero, we have a 240% spike in our Homeland Security spending. Now, some of that's going to be captured, right? Because the more that I spend on Homeland Security, the more that I lower the probability. But to think that we were 240% short seems like a pretty large gap. And so when they're having a reactionary, you know, they have a huge reaction, goes back to the Mueller overflow, they have a huge reaction to the fact that there was a big event, and it was a big, terrible event, right? But it was also accounted for in the original probability. There was a probability that there would be some large event. That's why the insurance market existed. And now we've settled back down to the same probability that that might happen. And, but yet our behavior has been adjusted in the fact that we're spending large, much larger quantities of defense, year to year. Of course, most of this has been talked about before, right? That's, nothing I've said so far is really all of that unique. I've cited other studies to, to do it. So the question then is, what's really the flaw with the fact that we're doing this, right? Aren't we safer? Aren't we willing to give up something for our safety? The answer is yes, whatever we're willing to pay for. But if we're overspending, and we're overspending permanently, permanency is what matters. And how does that undermine the market vibrancy? So I started with the M1 Abrams tank. The example that I gave you was from 2012. They had that same argument in 2011. They had that same argument in 2013. In fact, they just gave them $840 million above the budget that the Army asked for in order to continue making this today. And they're 2013 budget. 
This is in a time of budgetary crisis, by the way, that we're willing to overspend just to keep our factories going. And it is every year that we have the same debates. And the F-35 fighter, every year, we have the same debates over whether or not it should be produced, what's our job loss going to be. In fact, the F-35 has become so popular that they had an F-22 program that they did actually cancel. Um, one of the problems with the F-22 program was in the oxygen tank, so they had fighters flying it that would then suffocate. And so they thought this was probably a bad idea. Um, and so they decided that, again, that one too they thought was redundant. So they said, you know, we're going to close that down. The way that they closed it down was that the Pentagon went to Lockheed and said, we're going to close this one program, but we're going to, let, we're going to buy a, substantial lar a substantially larger portion of this more expensive plane so that we can cut this one program. Right? They have to trade. That's how the system works. Although it was an interesting argument because Robert Gates, the secretary, went in and said, if you fight me on this, I'm going to eat your lunch. That was literally what he told Lockheed Martin. He said, if you fight me on this, we'll cancel all of your programs. That's probably a bluff, but it's a pretty powerful one for a company like Lockheed Martin. But what happens with this permanency? Right? What happens if we're continuously overspending? What you end up with is a situation where your economy starts to diverge from what would have otherwise been the efficient path. Right? It's a story of opportunity costs. Right? I can't overspend on something without underspending in another area. Right? Resources are scarce, which means whenever I'm building more military equipment, I have moved my economy towards a more militaristic path, which means I've moved it further away from the non-militaristic path. So you end up with an economy, you can think of it as a line down here where we would have been efficient and we've been spending for the optimal amount of defense. Well now we're spending up here on more defense. And so we're moving away. We moved away, we're on an entirely different line. I don't know, it might be too dated, but you can think of you know, back to the future. Right? When Doc Brown writes on the graph, different timelines. That's what you're seeing in the economy. One path, the alternative path that we'll never see, and the path now that's more militaristic. And we get a new trajectory in economic activity. Right? You can think of it just in terms of the gun belt. Right? We built LA. We built places in Texas. We built places in Virginia based on defense industries. So now we have them. But what is it that we've done differently, right? We have these, we have no idea what could have been arising there. Maybe the town that's now in LA, the population that's now in LA, should have been in Kansas somewhere, doing something entirely different. Something that would relate to consumer wants, right? Something that you guys could have purchased. And so what we've done is we've started an entire new geographical reshaping of the US based on this defense spending, and the alternative, the opportunity cost, is whatever the U.S. would have looked like had we not done that. Right? And there is a cost to that. Just to give some examples, right? think about the planes where we're spending so much on these planes, $200 million per plane, we're building so many of them, and we don't know who they're going to fight. Right? Titanium. Titanium is used to build these planes. And so what we've done when we're making planes is we've taken titanium out of the market and put it into military production. What would it have been used for otherwise? Well, titanium, because it is a strong, lightweight metal, is also used to make really fuel-efficient cars. Right? Because it's lighter weight. And it's really good for that. So each jet, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but you can imagine it as one. Each jet that we produce over what we needed there's one less fuel-efficient car than we could have had in the economy. So not only are we losing the car, we're also losing any of the fuel that we could have saved by having more fuel-efficient cars out there. Okay. And so it's a process that builds on itself, and builds on itself through time. You get entrepreneurial <coughs> activity pulled from non-military uses. We have a lot of R&D in the military. 
Right? They're pulling some of our best and brightest to work on making faster jets, the marginally faster jet, right? What's the value of making a jet go three, mile, three miles per hour faster? We don't know because we don't have any way of navigating for that. And these entrepreneurs, these entrepreneurs, these scientists are taken out of making better cars or the better mousetrap and they're making jets. Jets that we may or may not need. Jets that we probably don't need given the fact that we know that, jet, that the political economy problems, the lobbying problems, and the fact that you know, we're very reactionary in our nature to defense. Right? So likely we're building too many. Each one that we build is a loss to the regular economy. What's worse than that is that each new resource added to the military economy, added in the direction of military production, further biases the economy in that way. Because when I make my jet, there are lots of complementary goods that have to be made to go along with that. Or there's now profit opportunities to make them. So I make my faster jet, so I need a slightly better radar. Right? I need a slightly better landing pad. Slightly faster computer to operate. Whereas on the other side, if I had built a car, I need a slightly better radio. Maybe some more tires, better tires to go with my new car. Like more parking lots, things like this. Right? The more that we do it, the more that we are getting better at making military goods, which means, relatively speaking, it's getting cheaper and cheaper to make military goods simply because some of them already exist. And so we're in fact getting further. Rather than just moving along the steady pace, we're actually diverging from the efficient. So we're losing all of the new ideas that could have been produced as well as gaining more new ideas that don't need to be produced, that are not efficient to be produced. And so as we go over time, since the end of World War II, our economy is becoming more and more militaristic in its production relative to what it should be in terms of economic efficiency. So we're getting more militaristic and less non-militaristic at the same time, which means we're getting worse and worse over time. These are the numbers from Fuller's article when he was looking at the fiscal cliff. Um, so he said, you know, in the original fiscal cliff, he said we're going to have a $1 trillion cut in defense spending. Of course, everyone reacted to this. Lockheed Martin's first thing that they said was, Oh, we have, you know, thousands of pink slips, and once the fiscal cliff happens, we're going to release them all, and it's going to be terrible, and the economy's going to be crippled. We know now that, one, they were bluffing then, and since the fiscal cliff uh, happened, it wasn't real. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of change in anything, and Lockheed Martin is still holding on to all of those pink slips. So, that didn't really get changed much. But, when he was first doing it, these were the numbers that he came up with, Fuller. So he said, you know, there's going to be basically a 25% drop in GDP. He's right, by the way, on the way that he did his numbers. The reason that you get these numbers is because if you have a government industry paying 25% of your GDP, and then you remove it, you're out 25% of GDP. In fact, what he's not accounting for is the fact that those Resources don't just get removed, they get reallocated, right? They get turned into something that's not defense spending. And so when he looked at these numbers and said, look, that's 25% of GDP that, that we're going to lose, he's looking at what's going to be seen, right? That's the scene. We're going to take that hit, and it's going to be terrible. But what he's not looking at, what those figures don't show, is that it could be but that's up to 25% of waste that we're spending year to year. And maybe not the full 25%, right? Maybe it's only 20%, maybe it's 10%. But for each one of those jobs that we're employing in this defense industry, in any of our defense industries, those could be jobs that are being taken away. Those are resources, workers, that are not being used producing non-military things. Right? So we're actually shoring up our inefficient economy, and we're worried about the fact that if we cut it, we don't know what's going to happen to those workers. Many of those workers are going to get reallocated to actually making things that consumers want to buy, 
and we'll be back in the world of the profit and loss function. And so we'll be determined, we'll be figuring out whether or not they're valuable. Whereas right now, we don't have any idea if they're valuable. We just know that they're getting paid. It's a much different system. And so each one of those workers, all the way down the supply chain, right, could be actually fulfilling to consumer demand by making cars, making toys, making TVs, making Xboxes. Like, wouldn't we all love for them to be out making more Xbox Ones so the price would fall? <laughs> right? Those are the things that we're giving up year to year because what we're getting is $400 million jets. $200 million jets and tanks that don't work and no one wants. These are our losses. And so we're getting continuous losses of GDP to GDP from the economic activity that's not underway. Right? And it's not going to show up in the way that we measure GDP because it's the stuff that we're not doing. Right? We don't know what the value of this is because we've taken ourselves out of a system of profit and loss where we can actually determine value and put it into a system where we can. And so as we go through time, our GDP just happens to be smaller by a percentage, but we don't even know. Right? We don't see it. It's the unseen. Some of the implications of this. The permanent war economy has been inherently distorted. Year to year, we get worse and worse. And in the literature, we don't account for it. Most of the literature looks, in terms of war spending, as I, even Higgs. When Higgs looks at it. He looks at it during the mobilization, the demobilization period. And in the mobilization period, what he's shown is there is a one to one correlation. So we mobilize we get more military production, we get less non-military non -military production. So in a mobilization, we're eating up non-military goods. Right? We're trading off at a one-to-one. -one. But this relationship lasts through time. It's not just in the mobilization and demobilization because we are continuously overspending. And so we are continuously distorting our market process. And in doing so, we're undermining the efficiency that's leading to real wealth creation. Right? Because when it comes down to it, real wealth is not the amount of dollars floating around in our economy. It's the amount of stuff that we have. Right? What we want is stuff, because that's, you know, you don't eat dollars. You eat stuff, hopefully. And so each good that we're not producing that people would value, because we're producing something that people don't value, is loss. It's less wet. It's less stuff for us to have. And so we're getting, at the margin, poor as we go. This also has military implications because given the fact that we don't get to determine what makes us safer, how much is going to make us safer, and what types of production will make us safer, we also lose the plan for actually we lose the ability to plan for the strategic defense of the U.S., right? We don't know whether or not people would be happier with the drones or with jets or with tanks. Right? We just, we don't have that information. And favors and job, you know, favors and jobs take precedence over actual security. So what we've got to do is try to rethink structure of defense. How do we try to remain secure from both the external threats of people that might want to invade us and the internal threats of the government that, while trying to save us, is actually eroding us? Right? It's actually making us poor by the very thing that they're trying to do to make us better, to make us safer. So what we're going to have to try to figure out is a fundamental institutional reform where we disentangle industry and Congress and the military, and we try to get back closer to a system of actual prices and profit and loss, a system that allows us to actually calculate the value of the products that they're putting in. Now the question, of course, is how do we do that? And that's really hard. And I don't think that we have a really great solution for how you actually get institutional change. And so this is where you know, I punt 
And I say, I'm either working on it, or you guys should go work on it, because we need more minds thinking about how we actually get institutional changes that disentangle Congress from the military, from the industry so that we can get back to a situation where we have actual, real mobilizations for crises and demobilizations when they're gone, so that we can get back to actually producing the things that it is that people would like to see produced. And back to a system where we know that they like that, because if you don't produce what people want, you take huge economic losses. And then we can actually calculate the value. Question about the insurance markets for terrorist attacks. Uh, there's a lot of arguments that are made about blowback in U.S. foreign policy causing blowback, and we've seen an increase in revamp of U.S. intervention over the last 10 years. Given the logic of the blowback argument, wouldn't the chance or probability of terrorist attacks be going up, or wouldn't we see that reflected in the terrorist insurance market? And if that's going down, what are the implications for the blowback argument on that? Um, so it's just, it actually hasn't been changed that much, right? So yeah, I mean, at the margin, if, if the actual probability that there's going to be a terrorist attack is rising, then, then you're, like, the probability is rising, so you're going to get higher insurance premiums, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, um, so Mueller and Stewart are the ones, uh, so 2011 book that they have where they run uh, calculations on this, and just show that it's not really changing that much. Um, and so maybe that does have implications for uh, blowback. Although, I mean, some of the blowback is whether or not they're going to attack the U.S. or they're going to attack, you know, our troops abroad, like our embassies and, and places like that, right? If, if they have easy access to those, then those are really going to be hit, and those really aren't going to be affected by the terrorist insurance market to see the tower. So, the, so it depends on where the violence is going to be going. So the terrorist insurance market just focuses on property retail in the United States. The um, one they look at does. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So since there's no like effective insurance market for U.S. embassies abroad, then when using the terrorist insurance market, underestimate the amount of money we should be spending on anti-terrorist activity. It could. Um, so yeah, there could be some underestimation, um, and so. Some of that, like I said, is going to get eaten up in the, in the fact that we're suppressing, that you are going to be suppressing some risk of terrorism. Um, it's the fact of the enormity of the gap that, that is. So, yeah, some of it's going to lead back. Um, although, like the Homeland Security spending, the 240% that I showed, is for Homeland Security spending. So that spending, not, they're not using that really to protect those bases either. Unless it was on data collection. Right, trying to pinpoint to intercept intelligence. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. So David Friedman has this argument about um, the benefits of inefficiently severe punishments. Um, that like we should just hang people um, if they like steal a pack of gum because the deterrent effect will be so large that no one will ever do it. Similar to like. Walter Williams' cheating policies that he not only fails you, he fails the people who sit next to you. Um, and he recommends that as like a foreign policy, that like if anyone bombs us, well, we won't only nuke their country, but the countries that are adjacent to them. To, to invoke like mutual enforcement as well as like really strong deterrence. So I agree with the case of, of excessive spending, but I guess how would you reply to like a behavioralist or like a, a Pennington reader who thinks that I'd rather err on the side of excess, um, given your unforeseen costs, relative to the consequences of, of being under uh, provided in military expenditures. Right? So like the, the missing comparison is is what under investment in the military uh, would look like. Um, yeah, well under investment is going to be inefficient. As inefficient as, as over investment. Um, why? Why would we expect equality between those two? No, I mean if you're, I mean if, if it's to the same. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, that was a poor phrasing on my part. So what you're asking is, the, why don't we just spend over, so I mean, the question then that you hit is, at what limit, right? Because there's still got to be a limit to that. And so in fact, I mean, what you're doing when you do that is, you're just raising what we're going to call efficiency, right? Because now you're saying, so it's not technically economic efficient, except it really is because I'm willing to spend over the amount that's necessary because I want that added security, right? But then you're back into the same problem when you do that, because how much are we willing to spend over the amount that we didn't know we were willing to spend before in order to, to just be sure that no one's going to do it, right? So like we talked before, right? We have the the U.S. Air Force program in, in effect, right? One of the stated goals of the U.S. Air Force program when they started ramping it up was we want to build our Air Force so big that no one else will ever even try to build one to match us. We just want them to not even start because then we know that we're always safe, right? So is that a sound plan, right? Well, if you put it into a market context, right, think about Walmart trying to operate under the same type of reasoning, right? I'm going to make so many products that no one else ever even tries to compete with me. What's going to happen? They're going to have huge substantial losses. And so when we have a program like that in the US, we're not seeing the losses, but we're still incurring them. Right? It's just the fact that our system doesn't allow us to know what they are under the current system. But we're still overspending. And so we, even if I said, even if that were my goal, right? does the 10th plane make that true, or does the 150? Right? At what limit do I cut that off? Or do I just say, why don't we do all the defense, and then no one will ever bother us? Which, given that we're doing 50% of the world, might be the plan that we're employing. Right? But we're still hitting the efficiencies. Right? And we still don't know how to calculate it. And the problem is one of how do we engender a institutional setting in which we can actually calculate people's demand for defense. And that's the challenge. But pointing out the problem is still worthwhile. Uh, my question is, is there an implicit relationship between rollback and industry itself and military uh, advances? By um, that, I mean, if, uh, if someone is, if, a, if the military is forced into a contract or is obliged to join a contract with, uh, with, uh, with the industry itself, then they get an excess of planes or, or, or tanks or whatever they need. And thus, are they implicitly um, incentivized to like use those resources that they have and riskier or um, more? Yes. So, if for no other reason than the fact that if I have a standing army, so you can just to put it in army terms, if I have a standing ar army, I've lowered the relative cost of going to war. Right. If I don't have the army and I want to go to war, I have to take the time and the resources and all to build it. Whereas if I have all of these planes just sitting around, then when you know Syria does whatever Syria is going to do, I'm just like, I got them. Right? They're already there. They're already on the way. I sent them you know, 10 minutes after I got the call. Because it's easier to do it. And so the cost of that is going to lead to using the military more simply because the military exists. So then when you use the military more, you're going to be more liable or more susceptible to the blowback. The blowback happens through some kind of terrorist attack or some kind of and then you start the system all over. And, and then you're just like encouraging more contracts. And so is it yes. self so it's, it's, it's Yes, it's a self-extending problem. Yeah, the way that the system is designed right now, it, it has the only feedback mechanism it has is one that's in the direction of let's get there. Right. Subject to whatever they can get away with in the budget. Because there is a limit to which people say, you know, I'm actually not going to spend, I'm not going to let the budget spend more than that. But obviously, as we've seen, it's pretty large. Right? And since the voting mechanism isn't clean, it's going to, you know, it takes a while for that information to actually get voted through. Yeah. But yes, it is self-extended in the way that the system works. I'm a little <coughs> skeptical uh, about the um, claim that the U.S. Uh, military is, you know, greater than the militaries of all the other countries and the rest of the world in terms of resources and you know, budget, obviously. If, if you think about China, China's budget is going to be in yuan, their military budget, 
and the Russians' budget is going to be in uh, rubles. And so one big issue there is, if you can compare everything in dollar terms, what exchange rate is the appropriate one for converting China's one-denominated military budget into dollars, similarly for, but not just for Russia, for all the other countries, uh, Britain, all the Euro countries, and so forth. But the other thing is that uh, to the extent that they use coercion internally for their military, for example, cons conscript armies, we pay to a certain extent a market price for, the, for labor in our military, which is very expensive, and they don't, and it's a lot lower. So even in terms of their own national currencies, their military budget doesn't come anywhere close to, um, you know, stating the true cost. And, and, and again, that's not to argue with any of the other points you're making. Yeah, I, mean, say, that, I find that a little strange. Yeah, I mean, that's just done. So yeah, the graph uh, was done by uh, it's a group out of out of London that does all like it, it does the world's military. Um, and yeah, it's just done that graph for the 2008. Um, just done by spending, like dollar budget spending. Yeah, but again, you run into the question of the exchange rate. Do you know what sort of exchange rate they're doing? Are they trying to use some sort yeah, of market rate, a purchasing power parity rate? Uh, yeah, I don't know what they used in order to get that graph, um, in order to get the, the percentages. Um, so yeah, so that's just the estimation could be, you know, so we do spend a lot, and so even if the estimation drops to where we're doing, Thirty-five percent. They still might, you know, they still may or may not be anywhere close to that over there. So, I mean, so you raise China up to fourteen percent, and we're still at you know, like thirty-five to forty percent or whatever. Right? So, I mean, so yeah, I don't know what it's going to look like when we do that. Even, I guess, even assuming uh, that the that the graph and then the the data is perfectly. Uh, are, are perfect and take everything into consideration. I wonder if there's any any information on sort of the the efficiency of, of, of those dollars, the efficiency of, I mean, if we're, if we're, if that was 2008, in 2008 we were spending almost half of, of uh, or, or our, or United States military spending represented half of the world's military spending, could we take on the rest of the other half of the world? Could we, you know, um, how, I mean, I guess it's hypothetical because I don't, like, I don't even know what you would call that kind of information. But it's, but, it, but it's, it'd be interesting to see if there's any any country with with uh, with a significant with uh, let's say a country that could really, for example, you could say maybe in terms of the the size of the standing army or in terms of like, so that would depend on a lot of things because I mean so. If I'm spending, you know, a billion dollars on manpower, and someone else spent a billion dollars to build nuclear weapons, probably his billion dollars is going to help compete mine if yeah. we actually go to war, that make sense. right? Um, so it's going to it's going to depend on a lot of things like that. That I mean, that graph was just to give a perspective, right? Just how large our spending budget is relative to the rest of the world. What I'm um, saying is that there's there's probably countries that. Their defense spend would use those dollars a lot more efficiently. Well, the other thing that may be happening is that everything that we're overspending, so say that total world military spending is actually where it should be, we're just bearing most of the cost of it, right? So we're, you know, that may or may not be true, but say that what we're doing is actually our spending is subsidizing Britain. So Britain doesn't have to have as large of an army because. Yeah, they don't have to spend as much because we do, right? But that still doesn't get us back to the question about whether or not the people, us, who are consuming them, would actually be willing to pay to defend Britain in the way that we're doing it. Right. Now, what you could say, and what you might be able to do to even get back to even a more, and so that's theoretical, I actually don't, I haven't thought through it enough to know whether or not it would work, but to get back to at least something of a market price would be to just have company, like countries like Britain, who we're subsidizing, just pay our government for whatever defense we're subsidizing, like however much they're, and so that's going to, what they're willing to pay is still going to be subject to the same problem of, like, they're not getting the right feedback from the people.
for how much the people are willing to pay, but at least we'd be back into some sort of a market context for how much the U.S. pays. So there are a lot of problems with that too, but at least we have some kind of a market. Right? And anything we get back to to try to get more closure to a price is likely going to be for the better. One of the things that this um, makes me think with your example of the, the Abrams tank and the F-35s is um, kind of a block to creative destruction, um, the concept of Schumpeter. And um, if you kind of look at the historical evolution of war, it goes something like, an oversimplification from fist to sword to gun to nuclear weapon. And it appears that this is kind of a, you know, the horse and buggy, you're making the horse and buggy a lot better, whereas instead of focusing going towards the car, which is the next level. I yeah, wonder if, if, yeah, I wonder if you have any information if there is tension with the research and development of new technologies that are like new military technologies, something that goes beyond weapons or guns, you know, like. EMP technologies that could take out computer systems, you don't hear much about those. Instead, you hear a lot about tanks and yes, guns and uh, stuff like that. Part of that is because, and, and in doing the research, you will really find out, they really don't like you to know what they're making. Mm. Um, right. Like, lots of times in this, you end up with the, this is restricted by NSA, right? Like, on the website, and then you're afraid they're going to come back at you in the middle of the night. Um, but so yeah, you're not really sure. But there is there is a weird thing that we do in our R&D in, in the military, which is we like again back to the capacity. We like the capacity to build really nice weapons, even if we never put them into production. Mm -hmm. And so we pay a lot for just the research and development of thing, um, which you know if you know much about how budgeting goes in, it actually ends up where they profit really well because they're profiting to think of the really good ideas, whereas the payout to those ideas is when you actually put them in production. And so what they're getting in the R&D is actually these like, super normal profits for thinking of these great ideas that never get put in. But we like that they're around. And so we're actually paying them a lot just to have the R&D, even though we don't want the factories to close. And the factories would have to be retooled, or we have to build new factories somewhere else just to, to make them. And so we don't do it, right, unless we actually unless we find a, another use for them. So yeah, you get a weird tension in the fact that they have really great ideas, you know, great for them, that never go into production, um, and we keep our other factories alive. Um, because you don't want to build another factory somewhere else if it means closing one down, because you're still going to get the voting votes. I had a, a few miscellaneous comments. Um, first, uh, your diagram about the uh, various countries and their expenditures. You forget all about the Martian threat. <laughs> the well, that's good. Krugman told us it was good. <laughs> We're waiting for that. The Venusians are really vicious, so we have to arm. <laughs> uh, another uh, miscellaneous point is we now have the shutdown of the government, and the Republicans have made one exception. Military. The military gets paid. They also pushed through about 94 contracts the day before the shutdown. Which, to give you an estimate, on like the first day of like the contract month of September or whatever, they did five. Yeah. So yeah, they're keeping them going. Right. So military number one. Uh, the other point was interesting. Well, you don't want to lose your military in the middle of a government shutdown. <laughs> God forbid. Uh, the other thing is, I'm not sure I heard you exactly, but I thought you said something to the effect of the closer we get to a price, the better. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Which uh, brings up a whole bunch of uh, interesting thoughts. First, you know, there's the normative versus the positive, better or not. It also brings to my mind the uh, debate over the draft during the Vietnam War, when Milton Friedman was a big fan of the volunteer military. And part of it was for freedom, but another part of it was to make the U.S. military more efficient yeah. in Vietnam. And if you thought that the U.S. Uh, side of the Vietnam War was the unjust side, what you would want, paradoxically, is not to have it more efficient, but to have it more inefficient, which doesn't mean that the libertarian comes out in favor of the draft, God forbid, but doesn't come out in favor of getting rid of the draft in order to make the U.S. military more efficient. Uh, so it's sort of a complicated... Uh, yes, complicated it is right, yes, and so it's the same thing with, with the military, right? You don't, like, you don't want... Yeah, if you don't, so my thing is in terms of 
we actually would like to have the defense, right? Um, and so it's a question of how do we get it and how do we determine whether or not we want it. But if your goal is something different, which is I want no defense, you're going to get a different analysis than the one that I get. You're going to get, this is great because we're going to end up in default sometime and we're going to be really poor and it's going to be really crappy, but eventually we're going to collapse and it's going to be great. Um, but that's a totally different goal and a different analysis that I'm trying to just, I yeah, my analysis, our analysis was just given that this is what they've stated that they want, they're not getting it. No, fair enough. The other thought I had was there was a very interesting debate during the time that Ron Paul was running among the lefties. And they all had impeccable lefty Marxist credentials. And half of them was, well, they all agreed that if Ron Paul got in, Grandma would have to sell herself in order to be fed. And, you know, we'd get rid of welfare and this would be horrible. But half, and they all agreed that he would pull out all the troops. And half of them said, therefore, we have to vote for Ron Paul and hold our noses over the welfare. And the other half said, you know, the very opposite. It's a very interesting debate. Uh, I'm not sure if you're into that, but one of the things you might look at would be that debate on the part of the lefties over the Ron Paul, let's pull down the, uh, pull back the troops and let's have free enterprise. Yeah, uh, I mean, actually, uh, like Bellman is straight up Marxist, um, but he's very good on his military analysis. And in fact, he, he steps into like the capitalist mindset to figure out what's wrong with the, the problem and how we're doing uh, that. Um, and, and a lot of the people who, um, so aside from this one, um, the other, another chapter of my dissertation was on sort of the origins of the, the, the how, how we got into the permanent war economy to start with, um, like how the interest groups arose. Um, and so it's a counterclaim to that of, there were lots of, so there were lots of Marxists at first, like in the, in the depression and, and left-sided people who said, we need the military, we have to keep it going because it's the only way that we're going to keep from going back into the Depression. Right? And so that claim was sort of disproven when we did have our drop and then you know, GDP actually took off when we demobilized after the war. Um, but they stuck with that and in fact you can see them and people on the right getting together, the people who are benefiting from the military getting together and saying, what we have to do is find a new enemy after course who they were who were they looking at they were looking at Russia already during World War II they said we're gonna have to do it later and it's gonna be and so I don't want to be too disingenuous but some of them were literally like this is how we're gonna keep our gravy train built right um, not everyone some people thought they're a legitimate threat right but that's sort of the literature and then it's only after a certain point when they realize when like, like when Melvin comes along and realizes so even if that were true, because he believes it's true that we needed military, that the war solved the Great Depression, which if you read like, like Higgs and others, right, that they, they sort of debunked that too. But he said, that's true. The problem now is we've got this massive monstrosity and we don't know what to do with it. And then he starts going through, well now we've gone too far, right? So we're back to, we had an underproduction, so we put it into place, and now we've got an overproduction and we don't know what to do with it. And so that sort of leads to the to the problem that we have now. And so, yeah, it is a weird tension that they have because what they want is the optimal amount of government interference in order to keep the economy alive without getting into the situations that, that I'm talking about. Right. And so it is a weird tension that they have, even in, even in terms of just talking about the military. I was trying to do a bit of a Google search while you were talking about uh, empirical research on the relationship between economic freedom and uh, military spending. Most of what I what I found was the was a standing relationship between peace and economic freedom. Uh, so lower rates of actual engaged conflict uh, and, and higher rates of economic freedom. And I guess there's some endogeneity issues because the spending is obviously calculated as a decline in economic freedom just in terms of percentage and size of the government. And so when we go to war and we mobile even even around a higher level, you know, we're still mobilizing. So when we go to war Sure. Even versus not war, we're still higher. But I guess that would be like the ultimate test and vindication of Higgs's thesis, that, that if we had a subsequent decline in economic freedom as a consequence to previous rounds of increased military spending, um, it would really be uh, like a tremendous like feather in the cap of, uh, of your argument about, about signing the magnitude of the overinvestment uh, and, and the unseen consequences. Because at that point, you're really cutting off your nose to spite your face. Like the, the entire notion of security sort of goes up a little bit. 
Yes. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I haven't tried to do that yet, but I'm not sure how you would hold enough things constant. Um, sort of that. Um, like, because if, if general spending also is increasing over time, even if it's at a different rate than military spending. You have to, like, and look at the subcategories, right? Yeah. Like, if you, if you took out a, a, a sub-index of, like, financial regulation or foreign direct investment or some of those that are for property rights stability, um, the sort of major major factors, I think you just, like, like what Claudia does, right? Mm -hmm. Focusing on the That could be fun. Could be. Yeah, I haven't tried to do that yet. Um, my, my next project is mapping the revolving door in the military industrial building. Cool. That's what I'm doing next, is just showing the fact that when you retire from the military, you end up working for an industry as a lobbyist. And if you retire from Congress, you end up working in the industry as a lobbyist. And it's like, it's like there is no, and then, and then like after a little while as a lobbyist, you get reelected to Congress, and then you're back in, and then who gets your benefit, right? You, and so there's like this continuous cycling through. There are people who have made an entire career, like lots of people who have made an entire career just being a military guy, right? and not necessarily being in the military at all. There seems to be a pretty established history of our research and development trickling out to other countries. Like a lot of our military technology, we end up either facing, like facing our guns um, in conflicts, or things like uh, EMPs. We're all, most of us are kind of aware of what EMP is by this point, even though we're sort of an idea to keep it secret. Um, so my question is, since there's such a tremendous it's so much more costly to be the ones to develop this than to buy it once it's already on the market or once it's already used, sort of buy it um, second, um, like through black market channels. I wonder if we're legitimately increasing our relative defense capabilities compared to the groups that we're worried about around the world because it seems like we're hugely subsidizing them in inversion, and I don't know if the cost benefit of that. So, yes, we don't often sell them our very best stuff. In fact, yeah. what we do is sell them the old, older, yeah. old age stuff. Um, but yeah, but every time you, you sell them, yeah, you're reinforcing the fact that you need to be that much faster on your on your R and D actually. And so you're back into that sort of feedback loop. Because I'm going to give you my jet because I got to have a jet that can combat my last jet, yeah. right? Um, and so yeah, you do end up in a, another weird situation like that. Um, See, if we're doing, so there's a trickle down effect in either military or in market stuff too, right? So if we were actually doing more of our market production, we'd get more of a trickle down effect in healthy economic growth around the world too, rather than the fact that we're selling them weapons. Um, and there's actually research going on by uh, Abigail Hall, who is a GMU graduate student right now. She's doing all of the sales of weapons and what that means. So I would look her up. I'm not sure whether or not that paper has been released as a working paper yet or not. And it may or may not be published. She writes really fast. She does. She cranks them out. Uh, but she's, she works with Chris there now, and so she's, she's working in the same thing. So uh, she's got a paper there, and her and Chris also have a paper on how uh, the drone industry is sort of a reintroduction of the things that I talked about, where the drone industry is largely lobby driven. Um, and so they have work out on that too.